I think that the problem we've got to deal with is how knowledge gets to the public for action, for communicative, cooperative action. And personally, I think that COVID-19 is just a warm up. Uh, this is transitory. Uh, the problem that is very similar and far more urgent for me is climate change, these days called the climate emergency. Both problems are similar in that success requires concerted action of everybody together. It's not a question of one person does it and the other can't. It's a real question of cooperation and the relation between uh, nation states and uh, civil liberties. These are very, very important and difficult questions to deal with. Now, I've had an interesting year. I started off in Spain. Actually, I was in Wuhan in China last November when we didn't know what was coming. Uh, and then in December, January, I was in Spain when uh, I saw people talking about this corona, the, the coronavirus coming. And it occurred to me as I watched the media in Spain, especially television, that I was seeing journalists talk with journalists, as you can see there. Perhaps that happens in your country too. And they were saying, oh, it's just like the flu, nothing, nothing important, we'll get through it all. And they convinced each other quite happily, those journalists. I came to Australia because I have to teach here and I found a, a quite different presence. There are programs where journalists speak with journalists to be sure. But in Australia, I was intrigued to find that there were scientists and top politicians together speaking in the media. And that people with actual knowledge, that is people doing research, running research, financing research, could appear on television and explain themselves. So I, I came from a culture which is very highly mediated, the Spanish culture, to the extent that one very rarely sees anybody from a university on television into another culture in Australia where it's quite normal to see people from universities uh, on television and on the radio. Uh, I just hasten to add there because translation has been part of our uh, problematic response to COVID-19. Um, I don't know, I, I've been on television and on the radio far more in this, these last few months in Australia than the previous 20 years in Spain. It's just a different culture, different avenues are open to me. Uh, and this has started to get me thinking about what a successful society might be in these terms. So there's an initial proposition here. The most successful society is the one that best communicates the findings of science to the greatest number of people. That's an interesting starting place. I don't want to say one society is better than another on all levels, but this is an interesting proposition. There are many, many other ways of, uh, of, of uh, comparing societies. I, I happen to like living in Spain because the wine is good and cheap and the people are friendly and social life is important. I mean, there are many, many other things there. With this proposition though, there are some immediate problems. One of them is that science is not a set of findings. Science we know uh, from Popper, if, if nowhere else, science is, is a, a process of discarding hypotheses, of uh, continually uh, asking new questions and uh, not of producing eternal truths, but of discarding untruths. It's a process of thought. And the other thing is that people do not understand science in general. And uh, I, I know this because I've, I've actually worked as a translator for quite a few scientists over the years, as I will uh, explain a bit later. Uh, but uh, in my faculty in Spain, my, 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 my faculty, my university, the chemistry department is incredibly important. And I've had to translate for chemistry professors. I've just, no, no way am I going to understand what's going on there. So what do I do? I sit down with them 
And I say, well, you know the terminology, I'll fix up the verbs and we'll get something in English for you. But I'm going to have to trust that you know what you're talking about because I don't. It's too abstruse. And uh, as you're aware, if you start reading it ser uh, seriously in people from other faculties in your universities, uh, this um, ideal of common understanding of the frontiers of science is uh, very, very difficult to achieve. And we can't assume it uh, just as a, as a starting position. It, that requires us to reformulate the proposition, and I would do it in this way. Uh, the most successful society is the one that most trusts the workings of science. I've replaced findings with workings. You know, they're, they're going to process things and do things differently. For example, in the uh, lockdown period here, one of the regular complaints among people was that the government keeps changing its advice. Why don't you just give us one thing to do and we understand that and we will do it? No, because the science doesn't work that way. Knowledge doesn't work. Actions don't work that way. People were applying uh, solutions to uh, situations as they developed. The interesting term there is trust though. Uh, people are not going to understand the reasons why an action is necessary at some stage, they're going to have to trust the person who is telling them to do something. And they can trust or distrust. And so my interest uh, over these past few months has been how trust and distrust work in this particular situation. To refine that problem, I, I, I'm setting up the problem uh, and I'm going to present a solution to it later, but this is just setting up the problem. I must say what I mean by trust. Firstly, for me, trust is not predictability. I had lunch today in an Indian restaurant just around the corner here, and I got the same dish as I always get every Wednesday. And I trust, I know that it's going to taste the same and it tastes very good, but uh, that is not the kind of trust I mean. That is predictability. I've done it in the past, so I know it's going to work now. Uh, that's just doing your statistics and, 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 and uh, working inductively uh, into the future. Trust is something a bit more difficult, particularly for this sociologist, Niklas Luhmann here. Uh, trust is a way in which we reduce complexity. Okay, I, I'm not ever going to cook uh, a curry as good as the one I had for lunch today. It's too difficult for me. If that guy has secret knowledge that I don't know. I will trust him to do it for me. The people who are doing research on a, on a vaccine for COVID-19 know far more than I ever will. I trust that they will produce a vaccine and I might trust them when I let them put that into my body. Uh, question of trust. It's not predictability. The same with language translation. Uh, my knowledge of Chinese is very rudimentary. If I get a translation from Chinese, I will choose to trust it or not because I'm going to trust the person who's doing it. And there's always, because I don't have the knowledge, right? You're trusting people to do something for you on your behalf because you are around. You are around. Uh, that's the kind of trust I'm using here. And Lumen in an early book, 1968, has a very interesting proposition. Uh, trust exists in the society to reduce complexity. But as we reduce complexity, uh, we can make a decision, uh, we can proceed, we can convert uh, knowledge into action. We increase risk because that person we are trusting may not be competent or may have their loyalties towards someone else. So trust uh, reduces complexity, it's very necessary, but it increases risk. And uh, the choosing to trust the people who are telling us what to do in a situation of, of a pandemic, for example, is not to be taken lightly or automatically. If you have cooperative action, which is the kind we need right now in order to solve this problem collectively, we must have trust 
but the trust is not necessarily a precondition. It's something that's developed in the act of communication. At the moment, because of the way, you know, we see that curve of new cases or deaths going down, we can see that something is working and there's an element of predictability that comes back into the mix, into the mix and we decide to trust even more that science, uh, even though we don't understand its workings. What's interesting in this is that uh, to look at what's been happening in Australia, which is where I've been living this experience, uh, we have access to scientists on the television and on the radio and in the media, but we have more access to mediators. And these mediators are like the social translators, although they're working here within the same language, English to English. One of them that everybody in Australia has seen, I think, on television is this man. And he's called uh, Dr. Norman Swan. He's a doctor, so you're going to trust him. He's a man. He's middle-aged. He's in good health. He's white. Yes, we will trust him. Uh, he's actually not a practicing doctor. He's a journalist who works on scientific matters. He explains things very well and very clearly. So people are prepared to trust him because of these indicators, these signals of trustworthiness, even though they're not told that he's not a practicing doctor. Another person that people in Victoria, I mean, Melbourne in Victoria uh, will no, is this man, this is a professor, Brett Sutton. He's a professor, the other guy is just a doctor, he's a professor and a doctor. And he is a man who would come out every day on television and explain how things are going and what actions are being taken. He is the chief medical officer of the state of Victoria. And he has achieved a different kind of trust. Uh, the, the journalist over here, has achieved uh, really uh, what we would call thin trust. We trust him because he sounds good and um, he's a doctor, all right? But over here, uh, Brett Sutton, although he has rather more authority and he is a scientist uh, working in this area of medicine, uh, he has gained more than that. I'll just show you, I think, uh, women and men seem to think he's very sexy. So, so you get websites and Facebook pages um, with his early photos of him in his youth, for example, and uh, lots of commentary on, you know, is he really married or what's he doing and who is he? And he's become a personality. Uh, if you're getting frustrated, uh, don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, you can buy your Professor Brett Sutton bedspread and sleep every night with Brett quite close to you. I am told, I don't have mine yet, okay? And uh, this develops into a rather different kind of trust uh, where you get to know aspects of the person. And this is called thick trust. And uh, we don't know, we're not able to judge the value of his scientific work or of his department or of the people behind him, but people have become inclined to trust him because he's a person a trustworthy person. And uh, this does inspire a different kind of reaction. Uh, thick and thin trust, these are very basic terms used in, uh, in, in trust analysis in societies. Uh, some societies have very, very uh, thin trust. Uh, German society, for example, is very much based on the titles a person has and, uh, and where they're coming from or which university they, they have attained their degree in. Spanish society, on the other hand, is very much trust in the person as a whole person, uh, thick trust. I want to turn now to the lo loss of trust and that has been around us as we've had a, a pandemic, we've had an infodemic. Uh, here, I, I get in my letterbox, believe it or not, postcards telling me that COVID-19 is caused by 5G uh, and all sorts of other uh, nasty things that are happening, and the common complaint in Australia on behalf of civil liberties, COVID-1984, that it's all a plot in order to, for the, the government, the state, 
who track us down and know where we are. It's, it's Big Brother controlling us. And the COVID was invented just for this purpose. Uh, there is resistance and dissent. Uh, in, at the same time as, as in our case, the majority of society has been trusting of the kind of people you've just seen, there is a vocal minority which has not, which has expressed dissent in these ways. The, the university has not been immune to this, immune indeed. Uh, I had a, a, a talk online by a colleague who had um, been to the Modern Language Association um, conference in the United States and, and was sort of reporting back on the ways in which critical theory could handle these various discourses that are coming up. And the way he proposed was this. Um, at the same time in the United States, we've had the Black Lives Matter movement. We've had cases where this statement, I can't breathe, uh, becomes the sign of protest. And this was implicitly attached to A, the effect of the virus itself, which affects breathing, but also to the masks that the state obliges us to wear, which also restrict breathing. And this kind of critical theory was thereby able to get together this image of persecution of the state, which works equally against racially different people and uh, controlling people through the restriction of breathing. It, it became quite a beautiful piece of critical theory that can juggle things and put them together and make lovely dissent. Uh, we can say, oh, we know what's going on there. Uh, we know that you shouldn't be killing black people in the streets, and we know that. We know it by law, we know it by, by, by respect for human dignity. Uh, but then this discourse, this critical discourse, was able to attach this to the whole COVID-19 thing and the restriction of breathing as well, uh, saying we know that our civil liberties are more important uh, than... Uh, uh, any measures you say are necessary to solve this problem. So once you lose that trust, you open up into an alternative discourse of, of freedom and of dissent. In translation studies, we do have that discourse. We have a discourse of dissent and critical discourse analysis that in, instead of uh, solving the actual problems we have there, we will sit back and analyze the language other people use and we will uh, spread, disseminate, ferment distrust in those discourses. That's very much around us in translation studies. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the colleague who was reporting uh, on the Modern Language Association conference also reported that uh, critical, uh, critical theory was declining in importance and was restricted to three or four sessions. I wonder why. Does it occur to us in the humanities that dissent and critical discourse analysis, as useful as it is for maintaining freedom uh, and mapping out the area for, that we require for critical thought, as useful as it may be, there are also others who are trying to solve problems and require trust in order to do that. And a lot of the work that we do may undermine the work that they are doing uh, in a non-productive way. I'll give you an example of that before I move on to the theory. Uh, in the press here, we've had uh, announcements of uh, about bad language translation. Uh, actually, languages being mixed up. You know, Farsi and Arabic look the same, and they were put onto the same. Uh, piece of information that was sent out. It's just a lack of testing in the translation process. And so journalists here picked up on the idea that the, the, the virus was spreading because of bad translators. And I looked at this and I, I know that the translators here are certified if they're working for the government. I could see it was a workflow problem. And I was wondering, what should I do? Should I 
uh, write, I'm asked to write about this, or I'm asked on the radio to comment on it, or, or should I defend the translators? Now, if I give a list of all the errors, and there are always errors, and we do have a list of them, that just undermines the confidence, the trust that people will have in the communication. Uh, the journalist wanted me to do that, and everything I said was twisted that way, to turn it into a critique of the language. Uh, but one of the texts I put out was to say that trust is more important, that uh, my action here is, you know, the translators in Australia are doing a good job. Please do trust them. Uh, it's a complex operation. There are going to be small mistakes. Fix up the mistakes. Uh, an interesting ethical dilemma. Uh, I decided to go that way. However, what happened is the government listened to the critical people and threw something like 43 million Australian dollars into uh, translation services in Melbourne, which, which probably had a much greater effect on improving things than did my, uh, my decision to support translators and encourage people to trust them. Anyway, I, I digress there. Uh, let me, I'm gonna have to go rather fast here. I'm not getting into that. Let me refine the problem here of trust. Uh, do we want scientists to be kings? This was Plato's solution to the problem. Put the scientist in charge. Uh, there are cases of, uh, Angela Merkel is a scientist. Margaret Thatcher was, uh, had her degree in chemistry. The great Ulu Beg in the 14th, 15th century was uh, founded a school in Samarkand, an, uh, an observatory. Great, great scientist, but he didn't know how to run the state and he was deposed by his son. Um, Alf Al um, Alfonso the Learned in uh, 13th century Spain, same thing, great scientist got lots of translations done, didn't know how to run the state and was deposed by his son as well. So perhaps not a great solution to make the scientists king, right? not across the board. What we have though is the king trusts the scientists and people obey the king. Uh, so we have had most of the leaders in Australia come out and say, we have to do this because it's what the science tells us. You know, I don't know about it. I trust the science, so you've got to trust me. But it's given as an order in some societies. In other societies, it's not an order, it's a recommendation. And so you'll have the king defer to the scientist. We do this because the scientist says this, and then the people trust the scientist, if they have access to them, and sometimes will trust the king, okay? Uh, you can work on this. What I'm interested in in my work here is to move from the uh, authoritarian societies of obeying, because you have to. There is a certain kind of trust that comes from obeying when, you, when necessary. I've obeyed you in the past. It worked. I'll obey you again now. Uh, towards trust, which is more an act of judgment in the validity and usefulness of what we're being told to do. Okay, now are we going to trust the scientists or trust, I use the king, the politician? The trick is this, in the humanities and in our universities, different faculties have different priorities. So in medical science, people know how to save lives and that's their purpose. But there are other sciences, perhaps economics, political economics, psychology, I would hasten to add parts of medicine where uh, our purpose is to preserve the quality of life. And there's a kind of trade-off that has to be made. Uh, the people talking to us now will say, I'm doing what the scientist recommends that I do. So you know, they, the risk is transferred over to science, which we don't understand, so we have to trust them, okay? But the proper work of the king in this case is to balance up, for example, viable economic activity on the one hand with psychological well-being, a lack of family violence, a continued employment, and then the measures taken to cure a pandemic. This, this trade-off is the proper work of politics and uh, the getting of the community 
to buy into and act on this trade-off is part of a political conversation that is happening in our societies. Even though it's presented as trust in science, uh, if there is true political work, and there is in many cases, it has to be in the encouraging and understanding of this conversation and then getting agreement on the correct balance on the trade-off that we're going to apply. So it's never a direct transfer of knowledge from one side to the other, from the scientist to the king to the people. There is going to be a chain of trust going back the other way, but the political work is deciding which of our faculties are going to have priority and how do we balance them. My new question then is, how do we best attain public cooperation based on trust? It took me a long while to set up the question. I'm going to have to go rather, rather fast now. Uh, I'm going to say what can be done in terms of translation. Not all of this concerns language translation. Uh, a discipline called translation sociology in French, uh, sociologie de la traduction, um, is otherwise known as actor network theory to many people. And uh, the people doing this, many of them from the uh, School of Mines in Paris, so hardcore practical science, are setting about or have been setting about seeing how knowledge is moved from scientists to society. But looking at the, the interactions between people uh, and the way they work. For example, here is Michel Caillon uh, talking about these negotiations, intrigues, where people tell somebody else what to do in terms of violence, acts of violence, by which an actor or force accords or allows itself to be accorded the authority to speak or to act in the name of another actor or force. Your interests are our interests. Do what I want. You cannot succeed without me. This is very, very negative. And this is called translation. This is what they study as translation. It's a sociological process. It's a communicative act. But you'll notice in that description, the entire absence of any sense of real trust or necessary trust, the absence of a cooperative act where it's good for you, it's good for me, a win-win situation. Uh, translation here was traditionally seen in very, very negative terms. E even though the studies are quite fascinating, for example, of, of how electricity spread in France, or indeed vaccinations. Uh, how did you convince a society to take vaccinations uh, in, the, in the land of Pasteur? Uh, the studies are great, but, but the theory was incredibly critical and, and full of dissent. Uh, for that reason has been attractive to many people in translation studies as such. But if I move on to more recent work by these people, this is Bruno Latour, uh, 2018. Uh, here, his book is on climate change and the discourses on the climate emergency. Rather, rather difficult, um, very different kind of approach. Facts remain robust only when they are supported by a common culture, by institutions that can be trusted, by a more or less decent public life, more or less reliable media. Uh, when we're in the age of the problems that we have to solve now, the terms of uh, institutions as being good, as media as having to be reliable, and of this translation relationship as requiring trust uh, has come on board. Uh, what was very critical at the network theory has become uh, a plea for trust. I'm also interested in the um, use of translation as a term uh, by Jacques Derrida within Deconstruction. Uh, some of the texts are well known, the Tour de Babel is, is the most frequently cited one, but I'm working from a book uh, called Duat, uh, what a philosophy, uh, straight to philosophy, or right to philosophy uh, in English, where Derrida is doing something rather different. This is going to sound uh, <laughs> sort of out of left field, but bear with me, it, it, it will make some sense. He's actually reading an early text by Schelling, these are lectures 
on uh, method in uh, academic studies in 1802, when they are setting up the universities in Prussia and there are debates about the different faculties in the university and how are they going to relate to each other? Which ones should be controlled by the state? Which ones should be controlled by the church, for example? Very, very uh, political thinking about the role of the university. And uh, Schelling uh, makes the case, surprisingly, that there should be no philosophy, no faculty of philosophy, because a philosophy, says Schelling, is in all other faculties. And uh, he, he's, he's looking for these relations between our disciplines where we can share common concerns and come together. So here we go. Uh, there is a, a philosophical drive to art. There's beauty in philosophy, of course, just as uh, there gives, there is a, a drive to a beauty in poetry uh, as, as well. And uh, Derrida goes on with this text, reading um, in, in, in quite some detail to find the connections between the different disciplines and the work of philosophy uh, was seen as being to locate and bring out those connections, to not just refine the terms, but refine the, the drives that were motivating people to do research in all these places. And Derrida says at the end that this as it exists in philosophy, as it does in literary studies, if you like, he says, this uh, V, German for as or comme in French, articulates an analogy, a symbolic affinity, the place for a passage for a translation, or the passage of a translation would be a better translation of it. Uh, I've got it in French there because I want you to see me translating as a process and not as a result. Just as Derrida's work on this text going from German into French is reading as and a translation as a constant process. And you, you'll see that why I'm doing this in a minute. So uh, we have to think uh, of the university uh, in terms of a logic of uniformation that is also a poetics of translation. And Derrida starts using the term translation for these relations between the faculties in the university and between our various disciplines, not just in the humanities, but well beyond, very much in the sciences as well. Uh, he saw the work of philosophy as in terms of uh, that kind of translation, but I've spent most of my life uh, doing actual translations and uh, writing about them, thinking about them, training translators and doing translation history. I want to just uh, give you an example from translation history now, which will relate to the, the sociology of translation at the network. Good. Uh, one of the issues in translation history is the supposed existence of a school of translators in Toledo, which is in Spain now, Spain didn't exist, it was Hispania, in the 12th century. Um, this is when uh, knowledge that had fundamentally been developed by Greeks and written up in Greek had passed previously from Greek to Syriac from Syriac into Arabic, uh, a lot of it in Baghdad, but then later on throughout the Islamic world. And these Arabic texts became available in Spain after the Christians had advanced in what they call the Reconquista. So Christians had taken over Arabic speaking lands and Berber, I might add, had got hold of these texts and uh, they were starting to translate them into Latin in the 12th century and into vernaculars in the 13th century. Now, it's said that there was a great school of translators in Toledo, where uh, European intellectuals uh, came into contact with the knowledge held in Arabic and made it available to Christendom. However, there's not much evidence of an actual school, and the school could mean various things. A set of people who work together, 
or people who actually are engaged in a learning process. Now, I traced it back to an account by a visiting English uh, clergyman, uh, Daniel of Morley, who was in Toledo prior to 1175. We know this because he comments on this book, the Almagest, which was translated uh, into Latin uh, by Gerard of Cremona, or most likely a team working for him. And Daniel de Morley tell us, tells us a bit about that process, the translation process. And what you have here is the actual Latin text, and it's 12th century Latin, so it's, it's sort of hard to make sense of. Uh, but the important thing here is that there's an intermediary called Gallopus, who is talking in the language of Toledo, which for him would be Arabic, because he is a, a Mossadab. He's a Christian who has taken Arabic ways and speaks Arabic. And as he speaks to the people, uh, uh, many people gathered around him, uh, they are writing it down in Latin. This is a translation process. Somebody is speaking in Arabic, other people are writing it down in Latin. And in another part of that same text, he talks about uh, Gerard of Cremona, who is in Toledo. He's there as a canon in the cathedral. We can locate him there, who wrote down in Latin what Gallipus, the Moss Arab, was saying uh, about the Almagest, which is this book here. It's Ptolemy's uh, view of the universe. It's the book that would tell you uh, well, Ptolemy has a geocentric view of the world the, with the earth in the center, but it will tell you very much that, that the, uh, the sphere, the earth is a globe, <laughs> you know, you're not going to fall off. So when Columbus went sailing out, he, he knew the, the knowledge was around that he wasn't going to fall off the end of the earth. I digress. No, this is all we know about what happened uh, with this book in Toledo in order for it to be translated. And working on this, I, I've come to the conclusion that it is exactly what it says. We know that the translation process in the 12th and then 13th century was usually teamwork because people didn't have the language competence. We know that some of the teams comprised three, four or five people. We know that there were intermediaries simply for the language part of it, telling us what's in the Arabic. We know the church had its people writing the Latin in order to control the knowledge. But when the text was written down, it was the product of a conversation of people working together and learning from each other as they were doing it. Was it equal? No, certainly not. Gallopus is only mentioned in this text. Uh, for the rest, he's not mentioned in the actual written translation and he more or less disappears from history. The same thing happened with Jewish intermediaries who have a merely marginal uh, a mention, uh, but were, were by all accounts uh, main players in the transmission process. This is how uh, essentially Greek knowledge uh, came into the Christian world and changed the languages. Was it a school? Yes, it was a school because they were talking and learning. Was it a translation process? Yes, it was a translation process because they were talking and learning. There is no difference fundamentally between the way people translate between cultures quite profoundly for this knowledge and the way we conduct our learning processes. I know this because many of my lectures in Melbourne, I look up and I've got many, many Asian people in front of me. And I don't know what language they're writing down in or what language they're thinking in. But even though I'm speaking English, I know there is a translation process going on. There is no fundamental difference, I think, uh, between the collective translation process, even if it's those languages operating inside your mind and the learning process in an institution. That's really the crux of what I want to get at. What's important here? in this particular moment, spoken before the written, and the spoken is the part we forget about, I think. Teams working in an interculture, they were in this place called Toledo, they were in, they were in northern of Spain as well, they moved around, but they were working together on a project 
and they were coming together because they were from different backgrounds. Uh, that's what I mean by an interculture. They're not there because they're, they're, they're alike, they're there because they are different, as we are in our universities in many, many cases. Translation is also a learning process, just as science is a process. And the thing that they moved from Arabic into Latin and then into the vernaculars was just as much a way of thinking, a way of discovering the world as it was a set of conclusions. And then uh, the people doing this were actually trained and financed by the powers of the day, by the church in the 12th century and the state, Alfonso the Learned, in the 13th century. They were not independent. Um, they may have been dissenters, but they, they played their games pretty carefully. Uh, if you were trained in Latin, you were trained in the church. And so the church had its control, but they managed to work with the powers in order to produce knowledge that was not laic, that was not of the church. It was scientific knowledge done with the church's support. I can go on to that, the relation with power, if you like, in the discussion. And then, as I said, the important thing that was transferred was thinking about evidence. For example, uh, there were astrological, astronomical tables uh, of Toledo to describing the positions of the stars when seen from Toledo. Uh, one of the uh, English translators who was present then went to London and wrote up his book of uh, tables for the stars as seen from London. So this in translation theory, we, we might call this radical domestication. Was it a translation? Yes, because he got the idea of the tables and the observations, etc., from the Arabic put into Latin, but then did the same thing, produced it, produced new knowledge by uh, moving it to London. This relationship between translation and teaching is uh, further in evidence when we look at some of the manuscript traditions. This is of, of the Latin uh, uh, translation of um, Euclid's Elements, fundamental text uh, by Adelaide of Bath, again from England, but working in Spain, done in uh, Toledo. And uh, uh, Claggett's uh, study of it finds in this manuscript tradition, that is the, the manuscripts that we find, the copies, the written copies that we find around the place, some of them are direct translation from Arabic, that's a translation. Others have didactic commentaries added onto them and the harder proofs have been omitted. So we can see, oh, well, this is the translation that has been used in a classroom, in a pedagogical situation. And then there's a third tradition within the, the manuscripts where the didactic commentaries are there with the proofs, proofs, perhaps for teaching at a higher level. So you can see that translation itself was not a static one-off process. We can see even then that the knowledge had to be gained in the language and then adapted to the various situations in which it could be used. I did want to show you there just before going on, Whoops, can we go back? Yes. Uh, this is the Almagest in, in Gerard of Cremona's translation. You can see that this is the actual translation in the middle there uh, with the diagrams, which were in the Arabic text. But look at all the commentary around it. They, they were talking about this text, trying to make sense of it. And you can't see it there, but often under the words, you have alternative translations other ways in which this could have been said or other Arabic terms that were found in the other manuscripts that they had to, uh, to, to, to justify before they started the process. So it was in, in no sense uh, presenting conclusive knowledge, it was presenting an ongoing engagement with the text. Some people do this very well. I, I want to just talk briefly about two people here. Uh, scientists that I've worked with. One is uh, Jorge Wagensberg, you can see there, um, much missed, he died uh, two years ago. And uh, I remember I, I finished my doctorate in Paris. I walked out and I said, never again, I'm not going to work in a university ever again because universities have nothing to do with real life. And so I became, among other things, a, a translator. 
And one of my first translation jobs was for Jorge Wagensberg. And uh, a quite remarkable man. He was a professor of irreversible processes. Okay, in physics, okay. He's, he's got his chair in physics in Barcelona. Uh, he also director of the Museum of Science in Barcelona and then in Madrid as well. So he was very much concerned with getting knowledge of science into communities and getting people fascinated by science, wanting to discover it. He was very much a writer and a newspaper essayist. He would uh, engage in debates and explain science for everybody, whoever wanted to listen, and wrote very, very well. Uh, edited 130 scientific works in, in a book collection. Uh, he was also an art critic. If you go around on YouTube, you'll find him in the Prado in Madrid explaining the physics of space in Velázquez, for example. And when I first met, oh, sorry, an aphorist, his books of aphorisms, very, very uh, creative person. When I first met him, it was in 1985, 86, and I, I translated um, the proceedings of a conference he'd organized on chance. And he'd organized that with people from physics, uh, René Tom, uh, from catastrophe theory, complexity theory, but also biologists and people from the humanities, philosophers. And he did everything he could to get everybody together to talk about common problems and discoveries. Uh, indeed, that conference uh, was welcomed by Salvador Dali. It took place in Figueres in the north of Catalonia. Dali was on his deathbed, but he was very, very pleased to, to welcome all these people. Uh, now, uh, Jorge tried, ne never saw physics as being separate from the rest, and he became one of these great communicators. Uh, and working from him, I learned a whole lot, not just about science, but about how to get it across to people. Uh, I would sit with him in a square in Barcelona. We would have texts which are very difficult for me to understand, the formal stuff in physics. And uh, I would help him, I would do the translation and ask him questions about it. And we would have the most wonderful conversations as I was translating these texts, because I was learning about it, and he was learning English from me at that stage as well. It was a mutual exchange, and the transmission of knowledge was not just translation, but also a conversation in an intercultural space. So a lot of the ideas that I put into translation theories and things come from human context with some quite remarkable people. I met last, gee, Saturday night, I had the great honor of uh, being with this man, Sir Gustav Nossal, who has been, who is an immunologist here. Uh, and for most of his life, he was in charge of a research institute uh, here in Melbourne. And it's just interesting. I was going through not just his conversation, but uh, this is an interview that was published in 1987 with him. Now he's one of these people whose life's mission has, like Jorge, been to connect science, the practice of science, with politicians. And he says on both sides of politics, he has to be friends with everybody and explain things to everybody and with the people who fund science and with the people who get science in the media. He was and is a communicator. Uh, what's interesting for me in this interview is that he attributes his success in this to having a prior interest in communication with the debating and that quasi political animal side of me. <laughs> he talks about his, his background in student politics. Yes, indeed, these are the kinds of people whom I see as translators. Uh, they are working in English here, Jorge in, in Spanish and Catalan, but they are working from the knowledge that they have into other languages, that is other ways of talking about knowledge. And uh, these are the people that I want to see as translators, as great communicators, as the kind of people that we should be uh, at some stage or that we need more of uh, in our institutions and especially in the university. In summary, 
I think, as Derrida was saying, uh, the communication of knowledge is like, German or French, like, yeah, translating into another language. It's just as difficult as translating into another language, is putting it across in simpler terms. And in our multilingual societies, it is translating into another language. In Melbourne, there are more than 250 languages spoken at home. If you want everybody to cooperate in fighting a pandemic, you need more than metaphorical translation, but you also need the stuff that makes it understandable. To gain trust, you have to put it in the languages that people understand, the ones that are the closest to their heart, as Nelson Mandela put it. And that's why you need those communicators to gain the trust in order for the message to get through. I think that when I'm training translators these days, I'm training people who are not just going to be translators. I know this, we don't, the, the, the statistics show us, so I did a, a lecture last month on this, that only about a third of the people we train as translators actually work as translators or interpreters. The rest use their communication skills out in many, many fields of life. And we need some of them who can go out and do the work with science and get that science into the media and into terms that people will understand and indeed in, into everyday practice. Um, you know, learning science at school is, is learning about a way of getting knowledge and everybody should have more of that. One of the great things I should note that Gustav Nossal did was get the Australian scientists in their academy uh, to produce school materials uh, straight from the scientists to the school materials. The fundamental skills we need if we're going to do this with degrees of trust are oral and social, that's spoken language, before they are written and individual. It's having conversations with people more than getting down and writing the great book. Yeah, we need the great books too, but we need people who are able to get down and talk about them socially. In this, in this mission, for me, it's the mission to get climate change as a discourse that people will understand. Uh, fundamentally, Rupert Murdoch. If we get Rupert Murdoch to understand, he is the head of News Corp or Murdoch Press Media. He is a climate change denier. If we can get him to change his mind, then we'll have something, something, some real change happening in our media. Uh, the university is part of the solution. There are many, many other institutions out there and uh, most of our universities are aware of this now. Most of us are aware that we have to work with the other institutions that are out there and that we have to train and produce people with the social skills necessary in order to do that. I think, no, I've just, yes, I'll finish with my last slide. I'm on the hour, okay. Uh, this is an example of bad communication. I mentioned it in a lecture last month, but I'll do it again today. Uh, this was a message sent to a family, which is an Arabic speaking family, but their English is excellent. And they are told that the people who had the uh, coronavirus are now through that period and they can end their isolation. And so they did. And uh, all the kids went back to school. Unfortunately, one of them, a son there, uh, hadn't been tested and didn't have coronavirus at the time and he had since contracted it. But they received this message that the isolation period had finished. And he went to school, he infected other people and it started off a, a network of infections that became quite important. And people are throwing the blame at the Arabic speaking family, quite unjustly, because in this message, they're told the family is out of isolation. What they didn't tell the family was that uh, that little boy there was in quarantine, whereas his siblings were in isolation. And that the department makes a distinction between these terms, quarantine and isolation. Look it up in a, in a society near you, okay? What the family did was trust the message. They trusted the message and acted upon it. 
what the people writing the message did was not make it clear, was not think about translating their knowledge into something that people could actually use, adding somewhere there, by the way, this other family member has to still remain in quarantine and quarantine is not isolation. Bad, bad communication. And this is a case of excessive trust. Uh, the solution, the $43 million that I talked about has been in Melbourne to get people to go and talk with people one-on-one, -on -one, have a conversation and explain things in human terms that people can understand. That for me is the way translation might improve our societies. Thank you very much.